Good morning, happy Friday. And it's super exciting to be here today with um, someone who I have known for quite a long time, going back to his work in Yolo County, and that's Dave Feliz. And he is the reserve manager for the Elkhorn Slough Reserve. You're gonna hear a lot more about him and what he does and kind of how he got to his position, which is a pretty cool position. If folks are interested in wildlife and biology, uh, you are going to be really excited to hear more about what Dave does and his lifetime of and career achievements. So Dave, it's great to, to be, have you with us this morning. Um, this morning, because we're kind of talking about wildlife, the question for all of the staff uh, is going to be around, what is your favorite or one of your favorite California native uh, animal species. So even though you might really love dogs or cats, that's great, but this is going to be, <laughs> you know, you can like bobcats, that can be, so we're going to talk about uh, that in, in your intro. So I'll start out and uh, my name is Mary Kimball. I'm the executive director of the Center for Land-Based Learning and I have lots of favorites, but I think one that goes back for me for a very long time is the Amer the, is the um, the California Valley quail. And I just remember, grow, I grew up on a farm and it was always so fun to see the quail, especially when they're babies and they're popping around with their little top hats, uh, top knots. And it was always something that as a family we would look out for in the spring. And uh, now there's lots of quail at our current headquarters near Winters. And I just saw a, a pair yesterday at our new headquarters in Woodland. And I was so happy to see that near our new wildlife area. So I've got them still in my life and, and they, are, they are lots of fun. So I'll switch it over to Dana. Good morning, I'm Dana Baker coming from the Tehama County Farms Leadership Program and I'm in Red Bluff right now. Uh, I have to say my favorite California native is the red fox. Um, I didn't grow up seeing very many of them, um, but currently we have a pair that live near our um, orchard. And I just feel like they're so, they're beautiful and you don't see them very frequently. So it always is kind of catches my eye and kind of awe-inspiring when I do see them, so. That would be my favorite. Yay. All right, Joseph. Good morning. My name is Joseph Montoya. I'm the Farms Leadership Coordinator for the Sacramento Valley. Uh, I was going to say also quail, um, not for the same <laughs> reason as Mary. Um, actually, the eggs specifically, um, it has to do with a certain kind of beverage, which, you know, that is a whole thing in itself. For Makuni specifically, so we'll give you a little bit of a teaser there. Um, but <laughs> I really like, I really like uh, rainbow trout. Um, it's native to California. Um, it's one of those things that um, growing up as a Catholic, uh, you know, meat on Fridays is a no-no um, during Lent. So, uh, you know, those times when it's like, you know, spring around this time, it's a little getting a little warmer. And, you know, normally maybe a burger on a Friday would be nice, but, you know, uh, some rainbow trout is also really nice just with some lemon and pepper. Perfect, delicious, rainbow trout. Yum. Awesome. <laughs> and they're fun to catch. All right, uh, Katie. Good morning, my name is Katie Wartman, coming to you from Fresno. I'm the Central Valley Farms Leadership Coordinator. Um, my favorite is the ruby-throated hummingbird. Um, I love me a little hummingbird, these little wings, and, and get to feed them with some sugar water. So it's kind of fun. Yes, they're coming around right now, too. Mm -hmm. All right, and let's see, Romy. Good morning, my name is Romy Wattenbarger. I'm the current county coordinator here in Bakersfield. And I would say mine would be white-tailed deer. We have a lot up at our ranch, and I just love seeing them run around, and you'll see some of the bucks with their big old horns. So I would say those would be my favorite. <laughs> nice. All right, let's see. Hi, I'm Letty Hernandez. I run the farms program in Monterey and Santa Cruz counties. Um, my favorite native California CC would be the monarch butterfly. Um, uh, 
Is that even native? I think it just migrates through here, huh? <laughs> Either way, I, um, I do love it when it comes to Pacific Grove. Um, and to be able to see them in numbers. I remember reading this really great um, book on California and um, they used to say that it would black out the sky with the numbers of monarch butterflies that would come through um, here. And so just having that image always, it, it, um, it's kind of scary almost to think of, of that kind of numbers in, in the area, but to be able to see them when they are all together is really, really great for me. Awesome. Thank you, Letty. All right. So we'll go ahead and get started with our guests today. And again, I want to kind of reintroduce Dave Feliz, who is the reserve manager for the Elkhorn Slough Reserve, which is in Monterey County. And but I got to know Dave back when he was the uh, reserve manager here at Yo in Yolo County at the Yolo Basin Reserve or Yolo Basin. Found, wait, oh, say, say it. Give me the right name, Dave. Yellow bypass wildlife area. Bypass. Anything good. Just say YOLO. <laughs> Just YOLO Basin, YOLO bypass, yes. which is a which is a special place for those of us here in the Sacramento region. Uh, and Dave really helped get that location up and going and 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 created into the amazing place that it is today. Um, for the combination between agriculture and conservation and natural resource management. And so today it's just, a, it's, this, it's this perfect opportunity to talk both about agriculture and about natural resource management and those people like Dave who do this for a living and who specialize in it. And so that you all know out there that this is something that you can do uh, and that it's something we absolutely need, not just now in, in our world, but going forward is how do we really manage these wild places that also have a lot of integration with agriculture. So Dave, I'm going to introduce you. I'd like you, although, although I'd like you to introduce yourself, give us some of your background and how you got to where you are today. And uh, to, yeah, share some of that to, with us. Okay, well, thanks. I'm happy to be here. And, uh, you know, first I should probably take care of business and name my favorite animal. And oh, please do. <laughs> Because I was I was I was just trembling with anticipation to share that, <laughs> and uh, so I'm going to go with a road runner just because it's uh, it's a cuckoo that runs and doesn't fly, and it can catch lizards and snakes, and that's pretty awesome and pretty weird. So I'm uh, <laughs> I, so I I really like that bird. So uh, my name is Dave Felice, and so yes, I work for California Department of Fish and Wildlife. And I've worked with them since 1984, and uh, so a real long time. And uh, I'm I'm have been really successful at finding the best job in the whole department, which is where I currently am. And uh, <laughs> uh, beautiful place, great staff, <laughs> and uh, you know we're doing all these things that I've always dreamed about doing. And so. Um, I'm originally, originally from Southern California, so uh, at a time when uh, suburbia was, uh, was taking over the landscape and uh, the orange groves and strawberry fields were disappearing. So, so I kind of got a taste of that and, uh, and, and so wanted to leave uh, as soon as I grew up, actually, to get back into more open space and been mostly in Northern California uh, ever since. Um, and so with the department, I've, I started in fisheries, which is where many people start, working on striped bass in the Delta and uh, tagging fish and doing uh, research on the, on the San Francisco Bay and then lab work with shrimp and, and larval fish and things like that. And then I got to work on our lands starting in 1988. And that's what I've been doing ever since at uh, four different locations, which has been fantastic to, to see different parts of California. It's such a diverse state. And, uh, and diverse habitats and diverse wildlife. And, um, and so to be able to help those animals is really a, you know, it's just a, just a real pleasure. And so, um, so with that, uh, maybe I'll um, go ahead and-, and, and Yeah, and yeah, the cool the thing here. about this morning, this morning's um, coffee with a farmer resource manager is Dave actually has a great presentation that he's going to share with us so he can really talk through some of these things that do need visuals a lot of times to help 
understand. So go ahead, Dave, and share your screen and hey. get started on your presentation. We'll see how this goes. I'm a total visual learner, so it's important <laughs> to me. All right, so let's see what happens here. And then we're going to do that part. Share and this. Woohoo! Is it working? I can't see. It is. There we go. Yep. Okay, yep. good. You okay, are, so you are good. All right, so this is where I'm at in uh, the heart of Monterey Bay. And, and you couldn't find a more perfect place to see lots of different kinds of wildlife. And there's lots of different habitats. And there's lots of uh, pretty intense agriculture in the area. And so I just wanted to point out that, that my location here is a fish and wildlife ecological reserve, but it's also a national estuarine research reserve, um, which is a nationwide system of reserves that are put together by NOAA has a partnership with a state agency that manages the coastal resources or sometimes it's a university and sometimes it's a, a some sort of conservation agency and at our site we work real closely with the Elkhorn Slough Foundation who is also a land trust and they manage about 4,400 acres in the watershed to help protect the watershed and thus protect the Elkhorn Slough. They're also our grant manager, so we can be very nimble with uh, how we do things, creating programs, bringing money in, in various ways. Um, and so there are 30 of these reserves around the country. And so uh, I get to interact with staff from all these different places. And so we have, uh, we might have common issues, but it would, um, manifests itself very differently in Puerto Rico as opposed to Hawaii or Alaska. And so it's, it's, it's just awesome to get together with like-minded folks and, and, you know, just realize that across the country, there's, there's good people doing very good work. And, um, and so I so very much value this ability to network with, with these other, these other folks. And, uh, plus, we get to go to the, some of these places to have meetings uh, once a year. <laughs> so hopefully, we'll be in uh, on the top left, Padilla Bay, Washington, in November. But we'll see what happens. It's a brave new world. So, on to the topic at hand, which is agriculture and wildlife. And um, so, a couple of things that I think I'll I'll point out is that you know, historically, all of our food, all of our plants and animals that we consumed came from the wild. We ate wildlife. And uh, agriculture was the domestication of those systems. And it's, uh, and, it, and it's often thought that these things are, are in conflict with each other. And often, they, realistically, they are in conflict with each other. But there is common ground that uh, I think it's good to, to seek out and capitalize on. And in uh, Yolo County, it just seemed like it was sort of the center of the universe for developing some techniques to, to do that sort of stuff. Um, we use a lot of the same tools and uh, tractors and excavators and things like that. So in this photo, uh, we're doing some disking with our tractor and all those birds on the ground are Swainson's hawks. And they are sitting there waiting for us to kill a mouse. And uh, I'm sorry, my dog is interrupting outside. Um, they, <laughs> they are, uh, you know, waiting for prey to get exposed by the tractor. And you see this throughout Yolo County or the remaining open space in Sacramento County. And you can have a hundred hawks circling around you as you're disking a field, preparing to plant. And, and farmers have known this for years. And these guys are eating the pests that, uh, would, uh, later eat that crop. So, um, so there is a, a symbiosis going on there and, and they learn to follow the tractors. So as I said, we use a lot of the same tools, backhoes and motor graders and, uh, and various tillage devices. Uh, in the bottom right is uh, we, we started using a, a tomato plug planter to plant native grass plugs that we, uh, we grew on some adjacent property that the Elkhorn Slough Foundation uh, owns and manages. We harvest seed there, we grow it in our greenhouse, we grow the plugs, and then the plugs are put in this harvester and planted out 
uh, as part of a restoration project. And so it makes us more efficient uh, to be able to use these tools. So there's four main areas we're going to be talking about. One is uh, row crops, another is rice, and then grazing, and then maybe a subset of grazing is stock ponds. And so row crops are things that uh, wildlife areas often will plant and uh, we'll, we'll do sunflower and, and then mow it in the fall and to attract things like pheasants and morning doves and use those in our hunting programs. And the same with, uh, with some of the larger grains like milo or, or corn. And, uh, and sometimes we'll even lease with, some, with, a, with a farmer to come grow it. He'll get a harvest and then we'll flood it afterwards and attract waterfowl and, uh, and run hunting programs out there. And then wheat in the bottom there is uh, something that's used a couple of ways. One is, is the sprouts are really attractive to migratory geese. And so we'll have what we call green fields where we're planting grain and, uh, and then these birds are attracted to, this, to these areas by the thousands. And then after a, uh, a harvest and the seeds are on the ground, then those areas are, are also used by ground feeding birds. So then we'll, so we're not after a super efficient, super productive field like a farmer would be. We don't need to go to market. We just need to feed wildlife. And so often they'll be using their uh, lower quality seed or they won't till as much as they need to, but they'll give us uh, something useful that wildlife will, will feed upon. And the, uh, on the top left is, for example, is what, what our safflower field might look like. Uh, well, there'll be some dock and some weeds out there, but we're fine with that. And then we'll just mow it like it looks in the bottom right, and then we'll use it for, for dove hunting. And that's a, that's a huge thing. And so like farmers uh, throughout the valley in March, wildlife areas are, are disking and planting safflower to try and catch those rains to get a crop for the fall. And so often we're doing the same thing at the same time. So moving on to rice. This is, uh, these are rice fields in the, in the Yolo bypass. And so if you can imagine these are, each one of these sections of this field is, is a terrace. And as you go from uh, left to right, you drop two tenths of a foot in elevation. So that whole field in the bottom left corner is two tenths of a foot higher than the one to the right, which is two tenths higher to the one to the left or to the right again, anyway. Uh, so it's sloping to the right and each of those is doing that. And so it's very, uh, these, these fields are very precisely graded and leveled and we have water control in place so we can very uh, accurately manage water levels in these ponds. And this is what rice farmers build in order to grow rice. And so, we um, included in our leases in the Yolo bypass, the requirement that the farmer was to create 200 acres of rice fields and not plant them, but instead we would use them for shorebird management. So I'll show you that in a little bit. But I wanted you to get this concept of these terraces that are two tenths of a foot apart. And rice is pretty valuable as uh, just as a crop. Rice fields are often full of egrets and ibis. And, uh, and right there is, uh, is the, the box there is the water control structure where they're manipulating the water level. Uh, this field looks like it's being drained and prepared for harvest. But there are literally thousands of crawdads at that point of that little piece of water there where those birds are. So they're feasting on crawdads. And when the harvest takes place, it, they just go nuts and they're following the harvester and, and they're jumping in front and they're grabbing food and, and uh, it's crazy. And then after harvest, the, the rice farmer needs to get rid of the rice stubble. It's very high in silicon. silicon. And uh, in the old days, they used to burn it, but we can't burn rice fields anymore or they're very limited in how much rice they can burn. And so they uh, found that they could flood it and it would decompose the rice stubble. So it's necessary for rice farmers to, to flood their rice fields to get rid of the stubble. Well, when you do that, you might have as much as 10%, 10, 15% of the seed on the ground. 
and uh, that attracts a lot of birds that come in and feed on that rice. And you still have all that stubble decomposing, so lots of uh, invertebrates are, are being generated there. So there's a whole lot of food being generated in these fields. And, uh, and so these are all tundra swans. And so you can create scenes like this. And in the, in the top right there is the capital of California. And to me, this sort of says it all, is that uh, here's this, uh, this management of this public property. It's, it's, it's generating economic activity. It's, it's growing food. And then it's attracting wildlife and uh, creating recreational opportunities all in the shadow of the, of the capital of California capital of Ecotopia, if you ask me. Anyway, uh, <laughs> and the, these are some of the same fields and we literally can have half a million de uh, geese. Uh, these are white front and, right, white front and uh, snow geese and Ross geese. Uh, we can get that many birds in, in these rice fields. So, and so everybody's winning on this stuff. And uh, farmers that are uh, flooding their, their fields can also lease out spaces for hunters to use those fields. And so this brings extra income in for these landowners. And so there are probably hundreds of, of duck hunting clubs in the Sacramento Valley and the, in the San Joaquin Valley where folks are hunting ducks in, in, in rice fields. Uh, so this is, uh, these are some of the rice fields that were not planted, were created exclusively for shorebirds. And so we would do 200 acres and flood 100 acres July 1st, and then flood another 100 acres August 1st. So we have this staggered habitat. And in the uh, concrete structure there, you can kind of see a, a two by four that's, 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 that's placed in those slots there. And that manages the water level in that field. And so you remove a two by four and you can lower the water level four inches, or you can put in a, a two by two and change it by two inches. So you can do very minute manipulations of water levels and to attract different kinds of birds. These are, these are black neck stilts. They have very long legs. And so they can forage in deeper water. But if you're something like a least sandpiper, your legs are only two inches long. And so you need very shallow water. And so we can, create a field and keep the entire field at this level for them to forage in. And so it's, so it's fantastic. And so these birds are already arriving in June. The last week of June is when the shorebirds are coming out of the Arctic and coming into the Central Valley of California. And so flooding July 1st, we immediately would get dowagers and least sandpipers. And then waterfowl would start arriving in August and September. And so then um, the, uh, so this got bird use throughout the summer. And then by the time we were flooding our seasonal wetlands in September, uh, then they could move on to those fields. But it allowed us to get through that dry, that dry uh, summer period. And this also mimics the natural phenomenon of these great basins in the, in the Central Valley that would flood in the spring and slowly evaporate. And so you'd have this receding shoreline on several basins over 300 miles of the Central Valley. And all that shoreline was shorebird habitat for birds coming down in July and August. And so this is what we're mimicking. And I guess another word about rice is that there years ago in the 90s, I suppose, uh, there was uh, created a North American waterfowl management plan and, and then that was all of North America, Mexico and Canada. And then it was broken up into these things called joint ventures. And there's a Central Valley joint venture. And so, and this, so these, this is where different agencies work together. And so we work with, the, we would work with the Rice Commission, we would work with Fish and Wildlife Service and, uh, and Fish and Game at the time. And, um, as far as the management of the Central Valley, there was an energetics study done to see, well, how many birds do we want to winter here? How much food do we need to feed all those birds? And they looked at all the wetlands and figured out how much food was being created on the, on the public and private wetlands. And they found that there is not enough food to feed all these birds, to feed the target number of birds. We need that rice 
to, in order to have enough food to feed all those birds. So uh, the rice farmers were uh, just integral to, to the success of, of, uh, you know, the, of, of this program of managing waterfowl in the, in the Central Valley. And there's probably about 400,000 acres of rice uh, in the Central Valley. And, and most of it is, is, is providing food for shorebirds and waterfowl. So moving on to cows. <laughs> we like cows. And, birds to cows. That's yeah. right. <laughs> yeah. We, <laughs> and we like cows because, uh, you know, they make money for us, and uh, but they also can do some habitat work for us as well. And uh, this is an area in the bottom of the Yolo Bypass Wildlife Area that uh, was called the Thule Ranch, and it's, it's, it's all pretty natural. This is an area with vernal pools and endangered species. And the thing is here is that there's an annual ryegrass that grows later in the spring, like at the end of April, into May, that just completely swamps this whole area. And, uh, and so you just get ryegrass like this, just swamp, just smothers everything. And so you bring the cows in and you uh, eat this in uh, May and June. And then you pretty much have bare ground going into the winter. And the first time I went out there, it was winter. And it looked like uh, like, like a feedlot or something. And I'm thinking, what are we buying here? You know, we're spending $12 million for this. Well, in the spring, then this happens. And all these native uh, vernal pool species show up. And then there's native uh, fairy shrimp in the vernal pools. And there's endangered species we found uh, brand new populations of endangered species that we didn't know about out there. And the cows had been managing it basically for the last 80 or 90 years. And so often that is the case that you see uh, the, as, as the department sees land that has these wildlife values and then these habitat values and there's existing activity on that land. In this case, there was grazing going on on this land. So when we purchase the property, we buy it for those wildlife values, but we have to recognize that what actions resulted in that habitat. And in this case, it was grazing. And so one thing we said right away is, oh yes, we're gonna continue grazing. And that goes a long ways towards settling the, uh, the misgivings and the apprehension that the local community had about the government coming in and purchasing land and uh, their fear is that they would go out of production and, uh, and become basically a weed field because they'd seen it before. Uh, the government comes in, buys land, kicks all the cows out, puts up a fence, nobody goes in there, it turns into a weed field uh, with invasive weeds that affect their fields. And, uh, but here we, we, uh, we continued the grazing and and actually, when we acquired the property, we suffered a pretty good budget cut. So we had no money to manage an additional 13,000 acres. We had zero money and we were actually laying our seasonal aids off. And so we were able to harness all this, this agricultural activity of the cows and the rice and some tomatoes and bring in about half a million dollars a year working with the Dixon Resource Conservation District. So they would manage our agricultural programs. Uh, they would take uh, something like 15% of the revenue and then the rest was available for us to manage the land. And so <clears throat> that gave us an income stream to, uh, to manage this area. So we needed to build infrastructure, we needed to build roads, we needed to build fences, we needed to do all these things. Well, all these farmers had crews that knew exactly how to do that stuff and were in fact doing that on these lands. And so we would put language in the lease that they would do some work for us. They would, uh, they would build a mile of fence every year or they would add three gates every year. And, uh, and so that was all built into the, the rent that they were paying. Uh, so just a wonderful arrangement and uh, what, which resulted in in the, this view from Interstate 80 as you go over the Yolo Causeway into the capital of California. And uh, if you look to the south, you'll see about a thousand acres of rice field. And in the wintertime, you'll see close to a million ducks and geese flying out of those fields. 
and uh, and 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 that's that's the scene. That's the, the that's the landscape that we created. That was making money for the community. That was uh, creating recreational opportunities for the community, and uh, and just showing how we could work together. And uh, so it was very very nice uh, result. So. Something else we would be doing out there is uh, we had about 800 acres of irrigated pasture. And so these were set up where we would run water on them to grow clovers and plants that were especially nutritious to, uh, to cattle. Well, snow geese love these fields. And so we would just get um, a couple hundred thousand snow geese flying through these areas and, and they would stay throughout the winter. And, uh, and so, Again, here was a management action that was good for the cows, and it was also good for for the wildlife. And we could we could manage hunting programs in those same areas. So at the Elkhorn Slough, it was a dairy for many years, and uh, which meant that uh, a lot of it looked like this during the dairy days. A lot of trees were removed, a lot of they because they were maximizing grass, and so we've had to to fix a lot of that stuff. But we are. You, they also introduced a lot of grasses that are from Europe and other places, Eurasia, uh, non-native grasses. And so we've, uh, we've brought cattle, cattle back onto the slough. It's a fairly small operation. I think we have uh, about 88 acres. And uh, uh, so we have cattle in three different sites. And so these guys are interesting. Uh, these are corrientes cattle which are used in rodeos and used in demonstrations and, uh, and he's starting to get into uh, our guys trying to starting to get into an organic beef operation and uh, so they're they're pretty cool and they're they're friendly little guys and they're not that big and they all have horns they, they never remove the horns and they do everything traditionally here they do it from horseback all the branding and the, the herding and uh, and so anyway, just a, just a really cool operation we have going here. Mm -hmm. The last thing I was going to talk about was stock ponds that uh, mm -hmm. folks that own land will create ponds to have water for their livestock. Well, in California, it doesn't rain in the summer and we've removed so much groundwater that there's very little surface water in California, especially in the southern and central part of California. And so this is provide, this is bringing water to the surface uh, and providing habitat for uh, lots of amphibians, as it turns out. And in fact, we do our, uh, our California tiger salamander workshops on a nearby ranch that has some stock ponds that we'll go over and, and sample and, uh, and look for the California tiger salamander larvae. This is what they look like. And there's also newts in these ponds and red-legged frogs. Red-legged frogs are pretty rare. And so these stock ponds are critical to the survival of these species. Because again, natural ponds are just almost non-existent in much of California. So there's a way to, to manage these, uh, these lands and these ponds to benefit uh, some of the native amphibians and really it has to do with uh, with how long it takes the tadpoles to turn into frogs so this is for example this is about red-legged frogs here and uh, in the top half the tadpoles are developing from May until July August or so and then they turn into into young frogs during that time our non-native bullfrog requires a longer period of time. They'll go all the way into October. Sometimes they won't even transform in a year and they'll, they'll live as adults up to two years sometimes as tadpoles. And so if you can limit the inundation time for the pond, just if you can drain it in August or so, then uh, you can be managing for red-legged frogs and eliminating uh, bullfrogs from getting established. And so that, that's a critical thing. So having some water control, again, uh, is, is a way to manage these areas for native species. And, and, and I guess wildlife managers and farmers, there's one thing that we have in common is that we're very much interested in moving dirt so then we can move water. 
and manage water, right? We want to make irrigation canals to move water to a certain place and then run, run, run water across the field. Well, wildlife managers use those same irrigation canals, use those same tools to bring water into a field to uh, manage a pond and to grow certain kinds of plants. And so there's, there's, we have very much in common there. Um, and these are some of the species that uh, live in, in some of these managed wetlands that uh, we've been able to create here at the, at the reserve by actually making depressions in the ground, putting in impermeable pond liners, and, uh, and then capturing water somewhere in a parking lot or off a roof or off a road, storing it and then metering it out into the pond. And in some of these man-made ponds, we have found uh, just this year, we have found red-legged frog tadpoles and uh, California tiger and long-toed salamander tadpoles. So very, uh, so there's definitely ways to make it work. And so, yeah, so those are the basic four ways or four uh, areas I was going to talk about. Um, and also, I guess, you know, we can create beauty. And so these are rice fields in the Yolo Bypass. And this was also part of a, of a new tour route. So we were inviting the public to drive out there and, uh, and see these areas that in the winter would have, again, hundreds of thousands of ducks and geese. Now, of course, our rice farmer was looking at us going, what, you're inviting the public to come look at my rice fields? And so he wasn't too sure about that. Uh, but, and, and you, you remember Jack DeWitt, rest in peace. Yes. What a wonderful man. He was always willing to teach people about rice. And so this just gave him even more opportunities to, uh, to teach people about the wonders of, of rice. And uh, so with that, I'd like to entertain any questions. Yeah, thank you, Dave. Um, that This is amazing to see these photos. Uh, and you can honest, obviously see why Dave is, is such a uh, well-known person here in Yolo County with, with regards to uh, government agencies working together with agriculture, figuring out ways to make it work for, for everybody, like you said, including the, the public, including the public benefit. And I constantly, because, well, right now I'm not, but usually almost every day I'm driving over the causeway uh, and I get to see uh, that, that incredible landscape that you've helped that you helped create and and it is continuing to to manage you know both agricultural and and wildlife lands and that all of those bird species that are there throughout the year but certainly in the winter when we see all of the amazing wild waterfowl that comes in so and then of course there's the bats which you didn't even talk about because right. you didn't help manage that necessarily but then there's all the bats so that come up from under the causeway too so for people who've never been to this region or never realized that literally right outside of sacramento is some of the most amazing water uh, waterfowl habitat that we have in the entire country uh, that you can get out and actually see and and drive to, to dave's point and learn a lot about agriculture at the same time so I wanted to see, yeah, see if there's anybody that has any questions uh, for Dave. Uh, I'm trying to to see if anyone is is uh, is coming in and with any questions. But uh, um, any of the coordinators, I don't know if this is new. It's probably new to a lot of you. So, uh, Joseph, did you have a question? Yes, yeah. yes. Um, I had no idea that that existed. I, you know, I traveling to San Francisco, you know, see uh, what it looks like the causeway, uh, when would you say is the best time to, you know, go ahead and have a drive and visit uh, these areas? You said that it can dry up um, in winter or maybe I mix some of that up. Um, um, well, the birds are arriving in August, September. So hopefully we'll be able to get back outdoors in the, in the fall here. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, as hunting season approaches in mid October, uh, then there's a lot of birds coming in. And then so, uh, and actually, during hunting season, there's a tour route you can drive on where there is no hunting. Yes. And uh, yep. it's funny, the birds kind of prefer to be there during the hunting season. And, <laughs> uh, so, uh, they figured so I, it out over the years. They're like, this is our safe space. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And you also want to, uh, uh, you want to be looking out for any field trips they're doing to the Thule Ranch. 
because mm -hmm. it's really a wonderful area if you want to see what the, the benefits of grazing in an upland uh, habitat area and and uh, and the wildflower show is, is just spectacular. So yeah, yeah, I would say anytime but uh, gosh, you know, I'm, 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 a, yeah. I'm kind of a nerd about wildlife. So anytime is a good time for me, even in the heat of the summer, the shorebirds are showing up. So, um, but uh, yeah, I'd say spring or fall. Excellent. Very cool. Uh, how would I get, um, know, uh, perhaps which, how do I access these roads? Like, is it on a website that you have or? Yeah. Yeah. You can actually uh, look at the Yolo Basin Foundation website. That's probably where most of the information is and it's open to the public and uh i don't know they are not now of course but uh but soon they will be we're starting to talk about that so um yeah soon you'll be able to 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 drive around out there and there is a tour route that you can drive and there's roads you can drive on and people go out there and go fishing and and uh go bird watching and so there's a lot to see there and if you can get on a bat tour in the summertime uh, it's just a fantastic experience to see half a million bats come out from under the bridge. So I'm going to ask one last question, Dave, and that is we have um, a lot of students who are interested in going into wildlife management, wildlife biology. And so I wonder if you have any tips, you know, that if whether you're graduating from high school right now or you're look, you know, looking to the future for colleges, uh, internships, do you have recommendations on how students can start to get some experience? Uh, well, not just, you know, your location, but literally anywhere around the state, because we obviously have students from all around the state. Well, yeah, it's uh, wildlife management is a pretty unique uh, profession because it combines practical land management skills with, uh, with science. And so, you know, the tools you use to uh, to capitalize on, on your knowledge of the life history of these animals uh, is, is equally as important as having that knowledge. So, you know, knowing how to, how to build a, f a field that will attract thousands of shorebirds is mm -hmm. equally as important to know uh, why those shorebirds are coming. So, you know, my, the ideal candidate for me is somebody that knows how to operate heavy equipment, that also has a, a sense of, uh, uh, you know, knows some biology and, and knows uh, a little bit about the ecology of, uh, of, of our wetlands. And so it, it is really that balance of practical skills with, with scientific knowledge. And also the ability to get along with a wide variety of people, because when you think about those two fields, um, the, the diversity of people that you deal with is, is all over the map. Uh, you know, because uh, I remember days where, uh, you know, in the, where, I, where I'm having a discussion about some scientific principle with somebody from UC Davis, and then later on I'm talking to a raccoon hunter that, you know, smells of cigarettes and dog. And, uh, <laughs> and so all that happens yeah, yeah. in the same day. And then meanwhile, you know, the, the, a delegation from China is going to be arriving in the afternoon or something. And so, uh, and I've had more than one congressman driving around in my truck. And so the ability to do it all. And so just that curiosity in, uh, in wanting to know everything and, and being open to lots of different uh, perspectives and viewpoints. Um, those, those are key characteristics, I think. So yeah, a, B, a science BS and some practical skills and use the summertime to get those jobs that give you those skills. Exactly, doing whatever, right, Dave? I mean, getting all of those basic skills under your belt is really helpful. The building skills, the right. tractor driving skills, the, right. the basic and, science skills, the, the customer relations skills. I mean, all of those things help in, in the kind of job that you have. Absolutely, yeah. And uh, so, you know, I got a lot of summer jobs with, uh, with agencies for the Forest Service or state parks. And, uh, and plus then you can check out those agencies and see is that a group you wanna work with. And, uh, but it's a great way to get experience. And, uh, and, and those folks are hiring people every summer. They're hiring students every summer. And that, so that was the model when I was coming up is to get those summer government jobs somewhere and, uh, and figure out which part you'd like the most. And, and inevitably, 
you you start uh, interacting with people who are are into range management or into forestry or into recreation or into or the fishing industry and uh, and those are all important perspectives to have uh, you know in your head as you as you deal with folks. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Dave. It's been great chatting with you for, for 45 minutes. We did a good long one today. And oh, today yeah. actually marks, which is shocking to me, we are one month in. We just completed the fourth week of, of Coffee with a Farmer Resource Manager. And I think this was a, actually a perfect way to end that first month. Because again, it was the com really the combination of resource management and agriculture and the importance of having the skill sets and the experience from all of the different parts of, of uh, you know, again, science and practical skills. So thank you so much for everything that you have done for us here in Yolo County, as well as now in Monterey Bay. It was sad when you left us, uh, but, but we'll have to come and visit. Those of us who haven't yet come to the Elkhorn Slough, come and visit the Elkhorn Slough too, because what an amazing place. And uh, we'll let you go and thank you so much and have a great weekend. All right. Thank, thank you. And thanks for including us in what, you know, in an agricultural setting. You I really bet. appreciate uh, land managers, all different kinds of land managers being included. Yes. So you're doing your part. Thanks. <laughs> We're trying. Thank you, Dave. Have a great <laughs> weekend. Bye-bye. Thanks. 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 Thanks.